Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The message for this morning is based on the gospel reading that we just heard from Luke chapter 4. We begin with prayer. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, in Jesus, our Savior, one of the first games that I remember playing when I was a young child is probably a game that you have played as well, hide and seek. And it was, I liked it, A, because it was easy to learn, not too hard to follow the rules, and I liked it because it was fun, because it was just a game. And it didn't really matter if you would find the other kids that you were looking for or not, and you ended up having to be it all over again. In fact, I kind of preferred being it. It was a little more interesting. It was fun to roam around the house in search of the other kids. Way better than being stuck hiding in some bedroom closet, smelling the dirty socks. But you know, when hide-and-seek wouldn't be any fun at all, If God was hiding and we had to try and find him. The season of the church here that we're in right now called Epiphany assures us that God hasn't done that. The simple message of Epiphany is that Jesus Christ has appeared to bring salvation to the world. That Jesus Christ has come as the one who has made things right between sinful human beings and a holy God. And he allows us, he is the one who allows us to live close to God, confident of his love for us here in this life on this earth and with a sure hope of doing that forever in heaven. And today we get to hear Jesus proclaim that message in person in his home church, his home congregation, And we note the reaction that he received. And as we review this bittersweet portion of the Bible, we ask God the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts so that we see that Jesus preaches the message that saves because it's a message that points us to him. There are all kinds of people who stand up to preach And they're holding the Bible in their hands, and they talk about what it means that Jesus brings you salvation. In hundreds of thousands of pulpits around the world, preachers stand up with the very same Bible in their hands, and yet they proclaim hundreds of different things about what salvation from Jesus really means for you. I mean, does it mean that If you shape up and you fly right and you devote yourself and dedicate yourself to God, he'll give you all kinds of good things in this world. Good house, good family, good job, good parking spots at the store. Does it mean that God's going to give you grace and strength so that you can constantly improve yourself so that you might be able to impress him and be acceptable to him by your acts of kindness to others? and ultimately earn your way into his presence? Does it mean that if you follow Jesus and you avoid big and horrible sins, then God will see to it that big and horrible tragedies and disasters will avoid you? Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus would just come down and clear things up? Jesus could stand up before people and he could open up his Bible, and he could preach to the world. And he could say, I have come to proclaim God's salvation, and this is exactly what it means for you. And if the words were coming from Jesus' mouth, well, no one would be able to reject it or refute it. And then everyone would finally know the truth and could believe in Jesus and understand what it means that Jesus brings salvation. But, of course, Jesus has already done that. Many times on mountainsides and in the countrysides 
and in homes and in boats and at least on one occasion in church. Today we see Jesus who walked into his home congregation, his home synagogue in Nazareth where people knew him best. And Jesus opened up the Bible and he read the ancient words from the prophet Isaiah. And he said, people of Nazareth, I am the Savior that God has promised to send to this earth. And I am the one who will save poor sinners who have nothing at all to offer God but their sinfulness. And I am the one who will free people who are enslaved to sin and Satan and they can't free themselves. I am the one who will give sight to people who can't find their way back into God's family and they're stumbling around in the darkness. And I'm the one who will bring good news to people whose consciences accuse them of being guilty before God. Jesus said salvation lies solely in him. And at first it seemed like things were so close to clicking. Like everything was going to fall into place Words of grace were flowing from Jesus' mouth. All the people in the synagogue had nothing but good things to say about him. It looked like the Holy Spirit was just this close to gathering in a harvest of new believers, people who would profess Jesus of Nazareth as the Savior sent from heaven and find life in his name. And then things went south really fast, didn't they? When the people finally understood what Jesus was really saying, they hated it. And more than that, they hated him. Jesus said that he had come to save them because they needed to be saved. They were the ones who were spiritually poor and imprisoned and blind and guilty. And that led them to want to take him off to the cliff. And they felt, according to their thinking, that they had a right to kill him because this was Joseph's son, they thought. We know him better than to believe that he is the promised Savior. He is going to have to prove it with a miracle. Show us that you are who you say you are. And so Jesus called them on their unbelief. He reminded them about how their ancestors once rejected a prophet named Elijah. And so God sent Elijah with his message to a foreign widow in a different country. And he reminded them how their ancestors at another time had rejected a prophet named Elisha. And God sent Elisha to an unbeliever named Naaman who listened in a way that they never had. And that did it. I mean, these were good church people. How dare Jesus say, that there was something wrong with them, and they didn't want to hear it. They began that day with worship in their hearts, and then Jesus got up and he preached God's message of salvation, and suddenly they had murder on their minds, and they took him out to the cliff to carry it out. But this Saturday in Nazareth was neither the time nor the place for Jesus to die. And so Jesus gave them the miracle that they asked for, probably not the one that they were looking for, but a miracle nonetheless. As he walked straight through that crowd, nobody could touch him, and he went on his way. And then he did something surprising. He kept on preaching. Not in Nazareth anymore, like Elijah and Elisha from the past, he went somewhere else. And God is still, or Jesus is still preaching today wherever his message of salvation is proclaimed in its truth. And Jesus is preaching here today. So maybe a good question for us to ask is, are we listening? Or would we rather take him to the cliff? And I think the easy and the obvious immediate answer is, well, of course we're listening. We're here in church. But Jesus preached to people in church too. And they didn't listen. They found his words offensive. 
And maybe sometimes we do too. When we see that Jesus claim to be the one and only way to life with God now and forever means that all other paths, including the paths that family and friends and neighbors and relatives are on, leads to hell. When Jesus says that we need to notice differences between different church bodies and not, not pretend that we're all united in faith when we're not. When Jesus plainly states that the things that you feel are so right are so sinfully wrong. But these things just scratch the surface of what people find offensive. What's most offensive is that Jesus says that he has come to bring you salvation, and this is what it means for you. It means that Jesus saves you fully and freely by his grace and by his love and nothing else which means that there is nothing, no difference between you and anyone else. That on our own, we are just as sinful and just as lost as the doctor who performs abortions, as the internet predator, as the deadbeat dad who beats his kids and his wife, as the woman who makes your living on the street corner. And God doesn't love us because we're good church people or because we grew up with Jesus since we were little. But he loves us and he saves us solely because he is a God of grace. That's the truth that led people to take Jesus to the cliff. How dare you, Jesus, say that there's something terribly wrong with me? How dare you say that I'm damned without you? Sometimes we don't like grace to be grace, do we? Do you ever wonder when Jesus will walk straight past you and go on to the next town? This is a sobering truth, isn't it, in this section? That Jesus doesn't always stay where his word and his message is rejected. And when his message is despised, he takes it elsewhere. This account of Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth doesn't seem to be full of very much good news, does it? The headlines in the local newspaper would say, Jesus preaches and Jesus is rejected. But listen again. Jesus walked right through the crowd, and he went on his way. And then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they were amazed at his teaching, because his words had authority. I think if you would ever take me up to the top of the steeple with the intent to throw me off, that would do it for me. But not Jesus. Nothing was going to stop him from proclaiming the message that saves, even when he was rejected. And you heard a beautiful picture of it in our reading from Romans, where God says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. And so Jesus preached. And when he was pushed off to another town, he preached there. Wherever parents brought their children to him, and when people carried their sick to him, and when people who were weary and burdened by their sin would come to him, Jesus held his hands out to them all day long. And he preached to them about human sin and God's forgiving love that's found only in him until that day when they took hold of him and they put him on a cross. And what did he do there? He continued to preach. He looked at the people who had rejected him and he preached, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And most of them didn't listen, but at least one did. And so Jesus turned to the criminal who was dying on the cross next to him. And he preached, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. 
He preached what the full cost of sin truly is when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he preached the message of salvation, the message that saves. And exactly what it means for you is this. It is finished. You're forgiven. All day long he has held out his hands and he has held on to you even when you've tried to push him away. And God is still, Jesus is still holding on to you as he holds out that message to you. You have the only message that saves just as surely as that synagogue in Nazareth the day that Jesus preached there. It's in your baptism, God's signature seal of approval that you are his and that he is yours. It's in the word of forgiveness, that pronouncement of absolution that gets preached into your ears each week. It's in his supper when he says, my body given for you and my blood shed for you. It's the message that God's salvation always has been and it always will be unearned and undeserved, but it is undeniably for you. Friends, Jesus preaches the message that saves because it's the message that points us to him. The message that gives us life with God now and life that never ends. May the words that we sang in our last hymn be words that are on our lips each day as we pray. Speak, O Savior, I'm listening. Keep holding your hands out to me and help me to hear your message and to believe it and to treasure it and to share it because it's the only message that saves. Amen.